A violent shudder tore through the crust north of Yakutat when a magnitude 7.0 earthquake struck at a depth of roughly 10 kilometers, about 6 miles, just after 2041 coordinated universal time. In the first seconds, as broadband seismometers across southern Alaska spiked, one question resurfaced with uncomfortable clarity. How many warning signs must a region show before its next rupture stops being a surprise? And more troubling still, if this sector of the Gulf of Alaska margin has a deep history of paired or sequential large earthquakes, is this event the first in another geological duet? To understand why scientists are watching for a potential second shock, one must look not at speculation, but at the mechanical processes unfolding along one of the most structurally complex collision zones on the planet. This earthquake did not emerge from an isolated fault, but from a tortured junction where the Pacific Plate grinds obliquely beneath the North American Plate. The Yakutat microplate, a thick, buoyant, anomalous fragment of crust riding the leading edge of the Pacific plate, plays the hidden role of disruptor in this region. Unlike ordinary oceanic crust, which subducts smoothly because of its density, the Yakutat block resists sinking. It acts like a geological battering ram, jamming itself into the continental margin and warping the stress field across hundreds of kilometres, hundreds of miles of coastline. Every major historical rupture listed in the region's record, from the catastrophic 9.2 Prince William Sound event of 1964 to the twin 8.2 and 7.4 Yakutat Bay earthquakes of 1899, carries the mechanical fingerprint of this stubborn microplate. The latest 7.0 fits this pattern with alarming precision. Its hypocenter lies near 60.3 degrees north and 139.5 degrees west, a corridor where geophysical surveys reveal intense compression, crustal thickening and blow-on-block grinding. When strain accumulates in this compressed zone, it does not distribute itself evenly. Instead, it localizes along pre-existing structural fabrics, thrust faults, splay faults, and deeply rooted shear zones that are remnants of earlier tectonic confrontations. Over decades, strain rates measured by global positioning system networks show the crust being squeezed by several millimeters fractions of an inch per year. Such seemingly tiny increments build immense elastic energy. When the rock strength threshold is exceeded, failure becomes inevitable. The mechanism of this event, based on preliminary waveform modelling, is consistent with shallow thrusting on a northeast dipping fault. This is the classic mode of deformation for the Yakutat collision front where the buoyant microplate bulldozes the margin upward and landward. As the fault patch ruptures, the overriding plate snaps toward the trench in a sudden elastic rebound, releasing energy that had been silently accumulating for years. The sharpness of the rupture and the relative shallowness amplify surface shaking across a wide swath of southern Alaska. The crust here is heavily fractured. Seismic waves scatter and reverberate through a mosaic of rigid blocks and ductile shear zones, causing prolonged shaking even when the rupture surface is moderate in size. But what makes this earthquake especially significant, and what justifies concern about a possible second major shock, is the historical symmetry that has long characterized this margin. The 1899 sequence produced Two massive events only days apart, one registering 8.2 on the Richter scale, the second 7.4, followed by a 7.0 aftershock. Their epicenters lined up along the same tectonic boundary where today's rupture has occurred. In 1979, a 7.1 event southeast of McCarthy also displayed unusual slip partitioning 
hinting that multiple adjacent fault segments may be primed at once. Even the great 9.2 quake of 1964, the second largest ever recorded worldwide, involved a cascade of linked fault patches failing in rapid succession over several minutes and roughly 800 kilometers, 500 miles of rupture length. These patterns suggest that the underlying stress field in southern Alaska rarely discharges all its accumulated energy in a single motion. Instead, one rupture may destabilize nearby locked segments by redistributing static stress. The concept of Coulomb stress transfer describes this phenomenon. When one fault slips, it can increase the shear stress on a neighboring fault while simultaneously decreasing it on another. If the next segment was already close to failure, even a tiny increase, sometimes only a few kilopascals, can be sufficient to trigger rupture. In the Yakutat region, where the fault network resembles an interlinked lattice rather than a simple linear boundary, the implications are profound. This 7.0 might represent the failure of only one panel in a larger mosaic. Seismologists analyzing early data are watching carefully for aftershock patterns. Clusters migrating toward or along the trend of major historical faults would be a red flag. After the 1899 events, the aftershock field extended across several distinct fault traces, confirming that a broad swathe of crust had been destabilized. Today's high-resolution seismic arrays can detect microquakes down to magnitudes lower than zero, offering a granular map of how stress is shifting in real time. If those tiny seismic needles begin outlining a structure that has not yet failed, the probability of a subsequent major shock increases. The geologic architecture of the Yakutat block also encourages multi-stage rupture behavior. The block itself is decoupled from the underlying mantle because of its unusual thickness reaching up to 35 kilometers, about 22 miles, and its buoyancy. As it resists subduction, it drags along the transform faults at its margins, creating zones of both compressional and strike-slip motion. These mixed-mode boundaries can rupture in complex sequences. A compressional thrust might fail first, followed by a lateral strike-slip rupture on an adjacent segment as the block responds to redistributed forces. These are not random aftershocks, but mechanically guided failures, akin to the cracking of ice when a heavy stress is applied at one point and the fracture races outward following lines of pre-existing weakness. Another factor at play is the long memory of tectonic systems. Faults remember their last major slip events through changes in frictional properties, poor fluid pressure, and accumulated mineral alteration along their surfaces. The region north of Yakutat has not experienced a major rupture of similar size for several decades. In tectonic terms, this implies that stored energy may be high. When the 7.0 released its strain, fault segments that had been creeping slowly may have been abruptly unclamped, shifting them into an unstable regime. Geodetic instruments positioned across the region record these changes as sudden offsets of several millimetres to centimetres, fractions of an inch to nearly half an inch, indicating that the crust is actively adjusting in ways not limited to the main shock fault plane. One cannot ignore that the rupture occurred close to the site of the 1979 and 1899 earthquakes, where the geometry of the plate boundary bends sharply. Plate boundary bends are notorious for concentrating shear analogous to how bending a metal rod concentrates stress on its outer curve. In this part of Alaska, the margin transitions between the transform-dominated fair-weather fault system and the subduction-dominated eastern Aleutian zone. 
Such transitions often store stress unevenly. A rupture on the subduction-related thrust could increase stress on the transform segment or vice versa, depending on local geometry. If the 7.0 has relieved compressional stress but increased lateral shear on the fairweather fault, the next rupture might not resemble this one. It might be a large strike slip quake instead, releasing pent up motion accumulated as the Yakutat block tries to slide northwestward relative to North America. The question then becomes are we witnessing the beginning of a broader stress release episode? The independent geological record offers sobering context. Paleoseismic studies of coastal uplift near Yakutat and Icy Bay reveal abrupt elevation changes occurring in rapid succession, often separated by only years or decades. These vertical shifts correspond to massive thrust events that lifted the shoreline by several metres, several yards at a time. When paired with offshore turbidite records showing simultaneous deep water landslides, the evidence suggests that multi-event earthquake clusters are a recurring pattern, not a historical anomaly. As scientists pore over the new data from this latest event, the emphasis remains on understanding the underlying mechanics rather than predicting specific outcomes. Earthquakes do not follow human expectations, but they do follow physics. And the physics of the Akutat collision front are unforgiving. A buoyant microplate ramming into a continent, a network of strained faults poised near failure, and a history of earthquakes that rarely travel alone. The 7.0 rupture may be only the first note in a sequence whose closing chord has not yet been struck. If you found this breakdown helpful, make sure to like, share and subscribe. And don't forget to tap that hype icon to push this video out to a wider audience. Your support helps these in-depth seismic analyses reach more people who need to stay informed. Stay tuned, because a full deep dive on this quake is coming in just a few hours.